Hello, welcome to uh, another live stream from uh, Apps Events and the team. So really pleased to have you along. If you are watching live, we really appreciate your time. If you're catching up with this later, also appreciate it as well. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a, a, a wide ranging talk this evening around remote working. So whether you're um, remote working from businesses or you're a teacher who's having to sort of grapple with uh, potentially working from home, then we're going to cover some of that. We're also going to be talking about getting your uh, inbox down to zero, so some Gmail tips, uh, as well as talking about the ISTE certification. So our subsidiary, AE Learning Labs, are running ISTE certifications, and we uh, also are able to offer those as an online version. Um, so we'll talk in more detail about that. So uh, stick around, and we'll we'll cover all of those things. Um, before that, though, let me just give you a quick run through um of what we've got on the agenda for the whole thing so yeah um we're continuing to do these live streams we're hoping to cover a, a wide range of things that are interesting to you if there's anything that comes up as a topic you think we should be covering we'd be more than pleased to hear uh, from you about ones that we can do in the future um, if you are joining us from the us then keep your eyes peeled for a november live stream that is fully focused on uh, north america and uh, uh, some of the key things that we're looking at there. So um, thanks to Acer, we're able to put these on regularly. So we're going to be hearing from Roberto from Acer just to hear about some of the, the insights into their devices in the education market. So look out for, for that. And just another big thank you for their support, which allows us to continue offering um, free, hopefully quality content um, for everyone that's uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel and sort of follows us, follows us across um, social media. Uh, if you would like to bag yourself a free seat on any of our boot camps or summits, so we've got a, a number of online boot camps that you can sign up for uh, to work towards the Google Educator Level 1 or 2. So if you're interested in getting that certification and you want to get for free, then just head to that link there, gsummit.link forward slash Acer, and you'll be in the chance of getting yourself a draw of a free ticket. Um, we're also doing online summits. It won't surprise you to know that most of the things we used to do, we're all doing online now. Um, so yeah, sign yourself up there and you've got a chance of winning yourself some free tickets to some quality training events. And as I said, if you want to learn more about the ISTE standards and more widely the ISTE uh, certification for educators, then you can head to aelearninglab.com where you can find out about that certification, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, we've got, Bogdan's gonna be leading our Gmail session, but is also um, a, an ISTE certified trainer, as is Wendy and Gitto are joining us as well. So there'll be lots of conversation about that process. They've all recently gone through the whole process themselves in order to then uh, share it with you. So. Um, if you've got any questions, and it might be just what is ISTE, if you're um, not from a part of the world that maybe knows ISTE quite as well, then that's a valid question to start off with. Um, or it might be a little bit more around, I'm aware of the standards, but what does the certification for educators just look? to say one thing as well, Ben. Um, yeah. Offering the ISTE certified educator, um, we'll get into it in more detail later, but very quickly it involves a two-day uh, in-person course, which is great fun. And then it also involves like four to six months of asynchronous tasks. But we are now running the two-day course completely online. So a two-day course is also available completely online. So it, so if, if you're in like most of the world now, you're in lockdown, don't worry. We've got courses starting in October, November, December, January. Uh, and again, you won't need to, to meet uh, in person to do it. Yeah, a really important change, I think, um, obviously. While we are starting to do some in-person events, uh, things are so changeable at the moment that um, an online course feels a bit more guaranteed. So great to see that that's available. Um, yeah, so as we move through, feel free to share. Um, so hashtags of Google PD and apps events. If you want to sort of share what we're talking about today, please obviously use the chat and the comments. You can see we've got a few comments coming in already, which I'll... Uh, uh, refer to, um, or uh, if you follow uh, at Apps Events One, the one seems to have disappeared off the end of that particular slide, um, and you can interact with us on social media. Yeah. 
desperately trying to get the at apps events Twitter handle, but the person's not responding and they have like two followers or something. <laughs> yeah, and like, you know, I, I was going to say, and you're, you'll offer lots of money, right? <laughs> yeah, well, if they haven't got a response, I'd be happy to give them something. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you want to sort of lobby the owner of apps event, <laughs> at apps events for us, feel free. We'd happily take it over. Um, okay, so um, just a few introductions as we get started. Um, I'm Ben. I lead our kind of UK um, support in the US and some of our Google for Education work. Uh, Dan Taylor, who you just heard from, uh, set up apps events in, I always forget the date, 2011? Uh, yeah, and 2012, really, really in full time. Yeah, so been sort of delivering Google related professional development since then. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce Roberto from Acer, who's going to talk to us uh, a little bit about uh, the support that they continue to offer to the education sector. Um, we're also going to be hearing from Bogdan and Gitto. And this is where uh, seasoned professionals will know I should have refreshed my slides. Uh, and you would also be able to hear from Wendy as well. So, Wendy, my apologies. Um, I added that one but forgot the refresh. Uh, so, Wendy Peskett's going to be joining us as well. So, without further ado, I'm going to just, again, welcome everybody. And then we'll start with the first sessions. Just going to jump in and look at the comments. So, we have hello from... Seku Lukman in Dubai. Um, we've also got Serdar in Saudi. Uh, we've got Katie joining us from Barcelona and Wendy in the US. Be really interested to know whereabouts in the US you are, Wendy, if you can give us a state. It would be really interesting to know. So thank you for everyone joining from across the world. Um, we always do describe ourselves as a global PD provider, and it's nice to sort of have that reaffirmed from the viewers as well. So please keep your questions coming in via the comments throughout for Roberto, for ourselves. And as we go through, we'd be really keen to sort of make sure you get everything you want. Florida, thank you. Thank you. Welcome from Florida, Wendy. OK, um, so at that point, I'm going to um, switch to a roundtable discussion. Um, so if I bring in Dan and Gitto, um, so, Dan, you've been working remotely for about what, eight or nine years? Eight, eight years full time working from home. So I think, you know, although I'm definitely not an expert, I think it's definitely not a new situation for me. And I think I've learned hopefully a few things along the way. Yeah, because obviously, you know, from the beginning of the year onwards, many of us have been thrust into this working from home situation. And obviously, we're going to talk about not just working from home as a business, but also as teachers. Yeah. Um, and sort of some of those things. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose when COVID hit, it wasn't really a significant change to your working arrangement. No, my day-to-day -day work is exactly the same. Uh, it's obviously impacted, you know, we're running in-person events. So I was traveling a lot and I really haven't traveled at all this year. So even though I was getting really sick of it, I'm starting to really miss getting on a plane. And, you know, this time, you know, you're in Google Photos, you get the, like this time last year, this time last year I was in Thailand hanging out with Gitto. Uh, you know, and it's like, it's, 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 you think, oh, I wish I was on the beach again, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely, uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's quite visible, but um, my cry for help is to try and get out of this basement office at some point in the near future. <laughs> it's, it's been a lot of time here. I mean, this, I mean, obviously, uh, for many of my colleagues from the classroom, I left the classroom a couple of years ago, so I've been working from home for a couple of years. Um, that combination of teaching from home, home learning, and also whatever else is going at home has been uh, a very interesting scenario. So I do appreciate having a basement I can disappear to at all is a bit of a privilege. I don't Definitely. know if, uh, we'll if get Google Maps sends you that email every month that tells you how many different towns and cities you've been to that month and how much distance you've covered. It was quite a shocking match opening it to see one town and three miles covered in a whole month. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to just jump in and say, Ben, you mentioned about teaching. I mean, I think the thing about working, if you think about your job, you essentially have, you know, synchronous tasks and, and asynchronous tasks. Synchronous tasks are one being the tasks that have to have at a certain time in a certain place. And asynchronous tasks are ones you can follow up. And obviously teaching is synchronous. So for teachers, you know, you have to have certain times of the day, you have to be there. And I'm going to talk a bit about the other asynchronous ones, because if you have some flexibility in your job, if you're not teaching full time or maybe your support staff, 
then you do have a lot more flexibility in terms of home working and mixing it up and working in cafes and also co-working spaces. Yeah, I, 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 for myself, I tried a few co-working spaces and cafes. Um, I find them tricky on video calls, finding the right one that you can have a video call on without the clinking or music in the background is one of those challenges. Um, I don't know if you... Yeah, I, we'll mention it later. I, I work in cafes quite often. I mean, I worked in a cafe this morning for like an hour and a half, but I've, I've given up doing audio or video chats. I mean, you can take, if you have noise cancelling headphones, you can do it. I just find the distractions not worth it. And I always come to my sort of dedicated home workspace if I have to do it. I think that's doubly important if you're running live lessons or live webinars as well. Um, so I split my time between teaching in a classroom or for the past few months teaching online uh, with a school and then doing the working from home um, like you're talking, Dan. And while I'm okay having a video meeting in a different place, in a cafe and so on, if it's a lesson, you, you want... You want to be sure everything's going to be fine. You don't want shock things to happen. You don't want someone to crash a plate near you. You don't want your Wi-Fi to suddenly falter. So having that base when you're in sessions where everything's going to be the same every time you sit down does make a difference, I feel. Definitely. And we'll get onto your workspace and a few tips to optimize that. I mean, I want to say the first category, I've called it work tips, is the first point I've got on here is obviously Google tools. We're obviously Google partner. We're all Google fan, fan, boy and girls. Like We love Google tools. But I think... You know, online tools are essential. Obviously, Microsoft 365 is, is a great suite of applications as well. Um, for me, you know, the tools I work with are equally designed to work online and offline. So we, you know, for example, now we're working on a shared Google Doc. We're all adding comments. Um, we use Google Meet uh, for, for, for video chat all the time, although I do use Zoom calls quite regularly. They're just as good. Google Classroom uh, and Microsoft Classroom clearly are the tools of choice for almost everyone in this situation. But uh, I, I think that the web-based tools, if you're not already using them, and I think almost everyone on this call is, is something essential to move to in, in this environment. Yeah. yeah. There's, Sorry, after back. you, get out. No, after you. There's, there's a real benefit in the fact that whenever you are working from home, whether you are moving around, whether you're in a different room now from when you were this morning, uh, if the children are running around, for example, being able to log into a computer, any computer, and having the same work in front of you, the same workspace in front of you on that computer does make a massive difference, uh, let alone when you start thinking of the collaborative side of working together. But just having faith that if your computer's not working and you're suddenly working off your partner's computer, you're still going to have the exact same things. You're not going to be searching around for that document you were working on the other day or trying to get the right USB stick to find your work on. So Absolutely. certainly cloud working, online working has... I think taken a leap of importance for the past few months um, as people were working more and more from home. Yeah. And what, another thing on the work tips I've got here is oversharing, which is a real problem. You've probably all experienced this recently. Two ways. One, you're getting invited to endless Zoom uh, and meet calls. And secondly, you're getting invited to so many group chats, you know, group, group text chat. It's kind of the online equivalent of if you're in a work environment and you, everyone knows the situation, you're always getting invited to meetings, end of day meetings at school, endless meetings. And often you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs because you're not critical to be there. So I think people really need to adjust this, uh, the online working way to, to the offline way and not invite people to meetings and calls unless they really need to be there because it's, it's a easy way to kill your productivity in, in, in non-teaching time. Just since, since you sort of talk about teaching time, one thing that's interesting, so a number of my sort of friends and people that I speak to are working from home. So Google for Education team are working from home for uh, the next few months at the very least. I was speaking to a friend who's is sort of uh, works for a bank and they're all transferring to working from home. Obviously, as a professional development provider, we've started doing more online courses than in person. So if people, for example, are signed up to the online boot camps, my question to teachers watching um, and something that people might know a bit more about is it, it seems to me that it would be perfectly legitimate for teachers to say, I've signed up for an online course. It's in the morning. So in the same process that they would use at school, they're going to request that they have the morning off and they can you know, maybe wake up in a more timely fashion and and attend that course from home before going back into school in the afternoon, if that's their situation. But I'd be really interested to know whether the teachers watching feel that that the ability, like you would go to a travel to a course in person, whether you feel that 
if you went to your school and said, I'm attending an online course, I'll see you in the afternoon, and whether that would be sanctioned or not. I mean, Gitta, you're closer to school reality than I am at the moment. It's from from my, I guess, personal answer to and the answer to everything, but from people I speak to, the answer is yes, because you used to have to take off the whole morning or whole day to do it. If you're suddenly saying, um, I've gone on a course, it lasts an hour, can I take a lesson or two off? That makes it much easier for the school in not having to have someone replace you for the whole day, your travel time. What I do think that you'll find harder to do is to convince the school, my course at 10, can I come in in the afternoon? It's more likely, no, no, you come in and teach 9 till 9.58 a.m. Yeah. and then run to your computer and do the course for the next hour. I think that's probably a more realistic uh, outcome if you're asking your school that at the moment, from my yeah. experience. Okay. Great. One of the things we're, we're trying to sort of understand is the where professional development fits in when it's remote and online. I think we, you know, we got to a reasonable position of understanding obviously inset days, twilight sessions, those type of you know, fitting it around a normal school day. Obviously <laughs> all all bets are off at the moment and it's all changed. So that yeah, that's my kind of my interesting one. And uh, actually uh Seku um who I was based in Dubai, I believe, said no, we still have to come into school. So, yeah, interesting. Thank you for that feedback. On Dan's earlier point about constant notification, how distracting that can be, um, not just work notifications. If you've got your phone next to you yeah. while you're working, you're going to have constant notification. Oh, it's uh, my memories on Facebook, as Dan said earlier. Oh, I might as well open that up. And it can slowly start draining your work away. Um, we do a lot of work on Google Docs, and I love the comments on the side. You know, you can put comments to your colleagues saying, oh, have a look at this, have a look at that. But they can really start taking time off your day if you're constantly, oh, I've got a new notification or a comment. Oh, I've got a new one. And it's distracting you off whatever task you're on. So Bogdan, who we're going to talk to later, uh, I've been working with him all day today in a project. And I think about two hours this morning, I kept messaging him going, Bogdan, where are you? Bogdan, Bogdan, can I, can I have a chat about this? And he popped up in two hours and said, yeah, I've switched off notifications because I'm having so much of them. I want to do deep dive into the task and actually get two hours of full-on work done. And I think it's important that uh, hey, Bogdan's popping in with a big nodding good on there as well. Yeah. Um, and that's important. It's important to be able to say to your colleagues and to yourself, I am working on this project for the next two hours. My notifications are off. I need to focus right now. I probably should have warned Bogdan I was going to bring him in to nod along to that one. But I, I thought as you were mentioning him, it was only fair that he got a right of reply. <laughs> no, it's okay. I will mention this also in my session uh, later. So good call. Good call. <laughs> As we say, yeah, when I he did we his work, he had a very, very long piece of work he'd done, so clearly it did have the right effect on him. Yeah. Yeah, we've I've had some content-related pieces, and what I found is that there's obviously the checking emails type of work, but where I've had longer pieces to do, and this is something I always struggled with in my, in my time in the classroom, was having one hour in a day sort of where I didn't have any contact with the students I'd always find it really hard to use that time productively because you wind down from a lesson. Maybe you sort of tidy up a few things in the classroom. Yeah. Maybe you sort of, you know, that's your opportunity to have your lunch. And then by the time you actually get around to doing anything, you just start to think about the next lesson. Whereas obviously the opportunity I get to do now, and um, Wendy mentioned she was in Florida. And I think at the moment, Wendy might correct me, but in Florida, students are at home. Teachers are at home too, I believe. So... To an extent, does that give teachers the opportunity to make their day a bit more flexible? Obviously, it depends on how the school's structuring remote learning. Uh, but yeah, like Bogdan, if I need to get something done like that, I just need to hide away um, and completely turn off all outside distractions in order to kind of do that bit of work well. So yeah, I can strongly I advise that. Distractions. We, got, we were going to talk about that a bit later, but there's a few concrete things. I mean, if you really cannot get into a quiet place. Not everybody can. I mean, noise cancelling headphones are, are something that are absolutely essential. I work, I've got the I've got the new Apple earbuds that are noise cancelling. I've also got the cans. That's one thing. It's just if 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 you cannot be in a in a quiet environment and it, it, it that's a concrete tip that can help you do it. I got when I I'm not good at switching off my notifications. Um but what I find is if I have something that I need to dive into a content piece is a for example when you have to if you're a teacher, if you've got a plan of your lessons or if you've got to uh, get a lot of resources done, 
sadly, the best time for me to do that at the moment is 10 p.m. until 1 a.m. because I've got a young family here. And even though I get to work and I get to now that things are settled a bit more, I can disappear for the day and get my work done while they're in school. Between 10 and 1, nobody's messaging me. Nobody's sending me uh, questions about work. Nobody's sending me an email. And I find with my time, I can finish a little bit earlier in the day and then get work done then instead. And that routine works for me. But I know for others, the idea of working at 10 p.m. would horrify them and send shivers down their spine. Yeah. So I think finding a routine that works for you is really important there. Yeah, definitely. I think we need to talk about work-life balance. Yeah, we've got a section on, on that and we'll get on to definitely. Um, I want to just quickly talk about um, location and workspace because this, this is a really interesting point. We we ran this session earlier in the day and we had a lot of people from Hong Kong on there. And, and they were saying, you know, in Hong Kong, everyone lives in a, in a kind of one-bedroom apartment uh, and, and you really don't have the space. And, you know, the way I see it, there's really a continuum. There's, there's a spectrum. Like the best situation is a dedicated office room or, or like Gitter has a shed, like a, a repurposed office shed. Um, second best is, is a bedroom, a spare bedroom that you use as your office, but no one really goes there. And finally, the third best situation is, is your living room. And I would highly recommend if you're working in the living room and there's no other option, a lot of people have no other option. Try to get a compact, small desk to put in there. I know that some people like the dining room table, and I, and I used to do it myself. But I just really believe that you should kind of guard your workspace. This is where you're working to do your professional work. And having a space that the rest of the family know they're going to leave just for you is is really crucial, I think. You know, And obviously, the best option is a dedicated room. Like if you look at where I am now, I've actually gone to the next stage of having an office 15 minutes from my house. So I've... I've gone through every situation. I've, I've worked in cafes, co-working spaces, living room, uh, spare bedroom, dedicated home office. Uh, and and if, if you have the option to have something close to your house, I found that is optimal completely because I can create a bit of distance with the 15-minute commute uh, in and out. But uh, yeah, guys, any comments on that, on the options to do with uh, working from the living room, working from dining room table, working from an office? You need a space. Um, I think that's the key part is if you can have, as you said, if you can have a room, a basement, a garden shed, an office 15 minutes away, that's amazing. But a lot of people don't have that. But whatever you're doing, you need a space that is yours and for working. It's, I started working from home first time five years ago in a smaller house, a uh, kitchen table. As you said, I think Dan's disappeared from view. Can you, I'm not sure he's still there. Um, and yes, okay, you can lay out. You've got a big table to lay out on. But then at five o'clock every day, you've got to pack all that up put it away somewhere, and the next morning you'll come back and unpack everything. And I mentioned earlier that cloud software gave you a the same screen to return to every day, that when you switched on your computer, you saw the same thing ready. The same is, must be true where you're working at home as well, that you can sit there and your things are where they're supposed to be. If you left something on your desk yesterday, it's still on your desk this morning. I think that makes quite a difference, whether it's a small corner desk in the living room or your own basement with a blackboard. With the blackboard, did you say? I did yeah. say basement with the blackboard. Yeah. Um, I just brought up a, a comment there from uh, Sekou Lookman, who's uh, talking about turning notifications off. Um, and obviously, it makes a good point. There's email, there's WhatsApp groups. Um, I don't know if, I don't know whether I'm stealing Bogdan's thunder here, but there's a couple of things I've done to try and manage that which is rather than getting my Google Drive notifications to my Gmail, they actually go to my chat now, which kind of separates those out. Uh, and one of the other things um, in terms of notifications is I've noticed, particularly with the Google for Education team that we work with, they seem to be quite hot on having their uh, green light or, or red, like not available um, icon in place when they're using chat as well. So using that to sort of identify and also calendar office hours when you you, know, you can get notified. If you try and sort of invite someone to a meeting outside of their official office hours, it will it will nudge you um, that that's what you're doing. So there's a few things there in G Suite I've started to use more to try and um, sort of manage the in incoming traffic. That well, 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 there. I think so. Still the simplest one is if I've got a task to do, I'll just close chat, Gmail, WhatsApp, everything, and just work it. That's still the, the old the older ones are the best, I think. When it I, comes to saying, that. I don't know when Sick was saying that he has to be accessible, whether that's accessible to pupils working or to other staff members. If it's other staff members' leadership, you need to be able to say, no, no, this this couple hours here, it's my time. 
my focus time. Uh, I know it's easier said than done, but I used to call it green time. And I would literally put in my calendar for anyone to see between 4 and 5 p.m. Wednesdays is my green time. Nobody can come and ask me a question. And if you come and ask me a question at that time, I'm going to be rude and say, no, not now. Come back in an hour. Yeah. And as long as I made that clear up front and had it in my calendar as get us green time, nobody took offense when I said, nope, sorry, come back at the end of my green time. I found that made a difference because, again, you've put the expectations there. This is my time. My notifications are off. Don't come asking. Hey, I'm hashtagging green time right now in the, in the comments. Um, we've actually, Katie came in on the question you're asking, Dan, about dedicated spaces. So <laughs> finally accepted I needed to carve out a small dedicated space in my bedroom. Um, and actually, what, uh, one of the... Uh, the new features that we've now got on our apps events account and is coming through to to G Suite account is the blurred background in Meet, which is obviously available in other video calling ones. Um, and I think that, particularly for for teachers um, who are using it, the ability to blur out whatever you know the boiler, the San Francisco poster, or worse, um, is going to be a feature. I think a lot of people are going to be taking advantage of um, where they are working from home. And maybe don't want everyone to see every intricate detail of their bedroom or whatever else they may be sitting in front of. Definitely. I want to jump on just to quickly mention about your work setup. There was a really interesting study from the University of Utah in 2012. And it looked at people moving from an 18-inch monitor, so already quite a good size, to a 24-inch widescreen monitor. And the time taken to reduce a task reduced from... Uh, eight hours with the twenty with the eighteen inch to five and a half hours with the twenty four. So a huge change. And I personally do this. I think it's something teachers don't think about enough. The productivity from going to from a laptop to you know even if you keep the laptop but go to an external screen and an external keyboard, I have found the productivity is huge. And and I've taken this to the kind of an extreme. I've got twin twenty seven inch monitors and and the same study found that if you work with a lot of spreadsheets and data then dual monitors is optimal if you're working on like for example video editing or editing type tasks um one monitor is is the best but i think if you're teaching it's great to have your video chat and have space on the same screen for at least one document maybe two and i think people don't give enough thought uh, about this and, and kind of a related point is if you're working on a laptop all the time, it's really bad for your posture. You know, you're, you're, you're looking down and your sort of upper back gets, gets rounded. And I think having a situation where you're kind of looking straight at the screen um, is really a, a huge difference because, you know, we, none of us know how long we're going to be in this COVID situation. And if it goes on, people, I think, are going to have some problems if they keep working all the time on laptops. I, I think extended screen is a gift, it's having it makes a massive difference. I can see um, as a coach said there that if you're doing training session or teaching or live lessons, having a dual screen just makes a world of difference. Because on one, you've got your Meet or your Zoom or Teams, whatever, so you can still see your pupils and see what they're seeing. But then on the other one, you can actually do the presence of your screen and show them the model and what to do. Even if you're not working on video lessons, just being able to have the document you're working on here and be it your email or chat, or if you if you are not taking your green time available somewhere else, you're not constantly switching screens and losing where you are and so on. Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive. I've literally got a cheap TV from Curry's, um, not even a monitor. It's a 60 quid cheap TV from uh, Curry's that I just put in front of me and plugged in. So you don't have to spend ridiculous money on giant uh, monitors. Just having something you can extend to makes a world of difference. Other electrical outlets are available. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the monitor one, I mean, we talk about sort of the the roles that we have. Um, it's also something we're noticing more and more. So th the training that we've delivered online, what something I've noticed is that compared to the in-person events, we're getting more and more teachers who are definitely um, less comfortable with technology, definitely learning skills very, very quickly, and they're very new to them. And obviously, they go into a webinar with us, and their immediate request is, okay, you go into the video call, open up a new tab with something else in, and moving back and forth between what we might be saying in the video call and then doing it hands-on in the other tab is, is, is a big step. And split screen or two monitors 
is such a useful way to be able to engage more effectively the training. Uh, and it is something that where I'm working with schools who we're doing remote training with, I don't expect them to have a mo an extra monitor for every member of staff. But where that's possible, and maybe particularly for setting up those teachers who are going into it a little bit nervous, um, who aren't sort of comfortable technology users all of the time, where a school can support them by providing them with that setup is ideal um, for get them getting the best out of the training as well. Yeah. I think related to this is also office chairs. You know, I think this is why I'm very much against the dining room table. I know some people like it, but I mean, longer term, you know, office chairs are best. You can get it, you know, obviously if you have the money, Ikea has some ones, you know, in the, in the Hong Kong discussion earlier, a lot of people were saying they're buying gaming chairs now. And actually gaming monitors are quite often cheaper than regular monitors. So, you know, if, if you look at the gaming chairs, James, our colleague in Bangkok has just, just brought one. And uh, and he said it's great, you know, that the posture's fantastic, you know, his his son used it originally. But I, th I think that's really something to think of, you know, the, the gaming chairs gaming and gaming displays are, are really good. But I think avoid, unless you're really good at sitting naturally with good posture, I think a dedicated chair is really important as well. You seem to have full support from Bogdan on that one, though. I'll, yeah, I'll also add in his correction. Gaming chairs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as well some of them are quite cool some of them if you are actually gaming you know they've got they've got, they've got speakers in the chairs some of them they've got some quite cool features yeah I, I, also, I want to hear my colleagues voices coming from my chair all around me to be honest yeah, yeah. i think I, I don't know if i don't know if bob uh was ready for this but we're gonna have to get him to also add into his talk about the uh the gaming chairs that might also go along with some of the i know isa has a sort of pretty slick amount of gaming related tools maybe it wasn't your target um i'll just bring bob in now actually hey bob can you can you hear me all right bob oh i think we've got a potentially a bit of a delay Hi, sorry because i'm listening to you on the youtube so i might have some uh, delay uh, but in dinner i was i was laughing because you mentioned exactly the two uh purchase that i made uh during my lockdown so the first one was uh, the second screen and the second was uh, was the second one was the office chair um so indeed for me that was vital uh, in order to continue my uh continue my working absolutely yeah thank you very much um, I, I hope i haven't uh, given away anything you're about to talk about in a moment um i'll just pop you back again backstage and then we'll be hearing from bob properly in a few moments time so thank you so much for joining in quickly yeah cool just back to you dan quick points i guess we're a bit behind schedule but we'll, we'll, i want to get a couple of things i want to mention uh first of all it's about your your schedule uh, we mentioned this before, but I mean, obviously, we, if you're teaching, that's un, unchangeable. You're certain times, but if but if you're in a support role or if you're not teaching full time, definitely give some thought to changing how you work. I mean, I used to work, you know, from kind of eight till five or six, but I mean, now I'm in a situation where I regularly get up at like five thirty. I get an hour or two's work done before the kids wake up. You know, I kind of love that quiet time. Then I'll go to the office and, and I'll stay here from kind of eight eight till three. Uh, and there's a, you know, I have a lot of flexibility to kind of adjust my day around my circumstances. So I think my really point of a schedule is don't recreate the office day if, if it isn't what works for you and if you have the flexibility in terms of your tasks. And if you guys have got anything to add on that, I know some people love to work in the evenings. Uh, some people like to even do a bit of Saturday morning work. I think it's great to, if you can, depending on your job role, use this opportunity to try to find a routine that works better for your, your natural rhythms and for your kind of family situation? I think lockdown brought that in a lot in that even though I've been working from home before, I was sticking to office hours because as soon as they were over, you had children and you had family life at home. But suddenly being in a house with two working adults and two young children, we tried for the first few weeks to keep the normal hours and that we'd pass the children back and forth and try and work alongside the children and it just didn't work. It was a nightmare couple of weeks. And that's what worked for us in the end. I mentioned working late today. What worked was saying, when the kids are home, I'm not working in the mornings. I'll have the children. And then I will catch up those hours later in the day when they're sleeping. That worked well for us there. Um, teaching is harder because you do have that 9 till 3.30 when if you're teaching uh, synchronously, at least, you have to be present, either in live lessons or present to answer um, calls and things. But 
certainly if you find you unproductive at night, finish at 3.30 and do your work later. But I guess teachers are used to working late anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I uh, I definitely... My work-life balance has certainly improved since I left the classroom, I won't lie. Um, it was, I think, every night of the week I'd be working, and I don't have to do that anymore. Such a difference. Um, the problem is with time zones, isn't it? I mean, if you're in a situation... I mean, it's got a good and bad. I mean, I love the fact that I can work with people in the US. I mean, every day I talk to people in America, I talk to people in Asia. But if you're in that kind of role, it makes it very tough. James was saying this morning about being in Asia and having to work with Europe. It means you would do evenings all the time. And I think that's something you really have to manage if you're in that situation. Yeah, I think that brings us... Uh, I know Wendy in the comments has put a few things about making sure you have your work and life routine separated so that you have something that makes a clear break between them. Um, yeah. So, for example, at, at 10 past 5, most nights, not today, I'm picking up my son from nursery, and that's my break. I know at that point my work is finished. Um, I might come back to it later in the day, but it's a clean break from work to family, just as if you were driving home from work. That's your normal break. Yeah. I think having those rules or routines in place that can say, right, work's done for now. It's family time for a bit. You have to hang on to those. Yeah. I think a related point to that is uh, various studies have shown uh, from large companies, which it, it translates to education as well. But when people have worked from home, they've worked a lot more hours than when they worked in the office. They felt the need to compensate for the fact they weren't there and people couldn't see them and to show their output. And so I think we have to be aware that it's a real problem of people overworking. You know, I know, you know, when I was at home before, it's very easy to come and leave the monitor on and, and go over and do some family stuff and come back and, and, and the, the blinking screen is there and you get back into it again. And I think, it, you know, it's really important to, to set some boundaries. I like to kind of have, you know, at least one time a day. Like after my work, I go outside, I do some activity before starting the family time. I think it's something that's really crucial. Uh, mm -hmm. All people are going to have, I think, more kind of mental health issues from this. Uh, I, think, I think I'm right saying that it's France that has a wonderful law where you cannot be... Uh, emailing your colleagues or your and especially subordinates after 6 p.m. That's 6 p.m. Every worker has a right to ignore any message that comes through. And some companies take it further and say that after 6 p.m., their email system shuts down. You're not e even able to, able to access your email after 6 p.m. Uh, I know you can't take it that far in every other country, but you need to be able to say, I'm not working anymore. And teachers are renowned for working silly hours anyway, even when we're fully at work. Um, coming home and marking and that's even worse when you're at home and therefore you haven't got that break the right and finish my work going home yep okay so yeah we're coming up to um switching over to uh bob so just uh said i just come in and sort of echo that point of that there is this challenge of constantly switching between roles um so segregating the way you can is great but it is very difficult um i know when i hear you know, you hear that your support might be needed in another room in the house. It's not like when I was at work and I couldn't, uh, um, wouldn't know about it. So it's definitely keeping everyone sane in the house as well. Can I add in one final point, Ben? Yeah, of course. Like, I think um, obviously there's some people who are going to watch this who, who, are, who are single. And I think especially for people like that, it's, it's really important to get some uh, some social time to get out. For me personally, you know, I like to, I play squash, I, I go to the gym. Like, I think it's really important to do some activity. First of all, do something physical, even if it's just go for a walk, you know, or whatever you're able to do, go and do something, but, but do something social, you know, go to a cafe, see some friends, like carve out some time because it can be quite isolating for people when you just spend the whole day in, in front of a screen and there's no, even though you might get annoyed with your colleagues at certain times, you know, it, it is isolating to be, to be all at home. Yeah, yeah, I can see the comments there. Someone's mentioned that every day they go for a walk for an hour. Yeah, that's have a great idea. Yeah. Have a clear head moment. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing a few of those tips and tricks. Please keep the comments coming if you've got anything else you want to share in. Um, and things for people who watch this later to kind of pick up on as well. Um, so what I'm going to do now is say a big thank you to Dan and Gitto. Uh, Gitto will be coming back in for the ISTE conversation. Um, and we're going to switch over um, and speak uh, again to Bob in a couple of moments. So um, just to give you a bit of background, um, Roberto is from Asia for Education. 
Um, so huge thanks, Dana and Gitto. I'll see you uh, both shortly. And I am going to uh, bring in Roberto. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, again for uh, for this opportunity. And if I may just add one piece about the very great conversation you just had. One of the routine I was doing uh, is that I was changing clothes. So even if I was working at home, uh, I prefer to have uh, some clothes just for working or just for staying at home. So that uh, to do to change my clothes, you know, even staying at home was somehow my routine of okay. From now on, I have to switch off my mind. I don't know if other teachers or if you were doing the same, uh, but this, let's say, is my recommendation to try to switch from uh, uh, working from, from working and stay at home uh, with your family. Anyway, <laughs> let's focus on a, on a different topics. So I really want to briefly to, uh, to give you some highlights from our side uh, about uh, the importance of uh, Chromebook at school. So, and it's something that we clearly experience uh, more and more during uh, these days, um, because as a company, and I probably represent in the uh, the Acer for Education team, uh, our goal is always not to just deliver devices, but is really to talk with all the stakeholders, uh, and not just uh, let's say the big giants like uh, Google, for instance, uh, or or Intel, uh, or with our reseller but most importantly with those that are on fields, speaking with schools and with teachers, like for instance, company like Apps Event that are crucial as for us, the professional development is a key asset. And then uh, talking uh, directly with schools. Um, so I wanted to, to introduce uh, my speech to, uh, to present um, on a program that we have uh, here in EMEA uh, that is called Innovative School. The idea is basically to embrace the most innovative uh, school from Acer and uh, meet them once uh, per year and share experience. And this was a goldmine for us uh, because the topics were really related about uh, the digital learning. So the devices were just a minor asset. So the main topic was really how we, are, how we became digital, how we transform our school from an analog to uh, a digital one. And if I have to choose the three main uh, um, pillars that I learn uh, speaking with all of them, and by the way, the beautiness of this program is that we can talk at the same time with school coming from uh, Dubai or from Barcelona or from uh, UK or from South Africa. But what the, the, all these schools they have in common is that, first of all, they didn't become digital from one day to another. I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, and the same approach uh, can be applicable to a school when they decide to become digital. So the planning and the development uh, of this planning was absolutely crucial. And it's not just related about introducing the technology, introducing the Chromebook, but was also about uh, training the teachers. So started with few of them, making them convinced, and to show to the others that the, the technology can work smoothless in a, in a, smoothly in, the, in, a, in, a, in a classroom and bring a lot of benefits. And then clearly lab, laptops uh, can also open a lot of new opportunities uh, when it comes to innovate. Because uh, if you look in the market, it's full of uh, solution related to STEAM. Um, and thanks to the progress that the technology and uh, the platform has made in the last years, it's really easy. So many of the solution are really plug and play because this at the end is the key. So whatever you bring into your classroom, they must be up and running in a matter of seconds or minutes. You cannot lose too much time. You're not uh, on paper on an IT admin. So the conversation and the classroom life uh, uh, should proceed as usual. And then the versatility. Um, so I mentioned before Barcelona, this was actually a picture taken in a school on this beautiful city. Uh, the students, they were not waiting for us. Uh, but it, it, what is good to highlight is that all the students, they were using the same device in four different ways. And the experience for the teacher's perspective was absolutely the same. So there is no change in the progress of the lesson, but the students were free to follow the lessons uh, at, at, the, at their best, at the, the, the way they decided is the most, uh, the most comfortable. Now, um, when it comes to the size, the, 
uh, the device to, to introduce uh, why the schools decided at the end to go for the Chromebooks. And uh, we can probably highlight three main uh, pillars out of all of those. Uh, the first one is the speed. Um, many teachers told us, for us, it's important that the device is up and running in a matter of seconds. And if I need uh, to ask my students to close the device because I need uh, their full attention about what I'm saying, I need to be able to restart the usage of the device again in a matter of seconds. And the Chromebook are those kind of devices. Even for the, let's say, the low entry level, thanks to the fact that the, the design, uh, the, the operating system, so the Chrome OS has been the size, has been designed as a cloud-based operative system, the hardware requirements are very low. So this is why it's possible to achieve this great performance. And as I said, there is a great benefit when it comes to classroom life. The second one is clearly the security. Um, so Chromebook, they don't need any antivirus because there are no virus for the Chrome OS. And most importantly, with the Google Admin Console, uh, the IT admin or the teachers that are acting like the IT admin, they can easily manage all the configuration in terms of privacy, settings, and the permission about what the students can do with their own Chromebooks. And uh, the beauty of the platform is that with one person, you can control 10, hundreds, or even thousands of devices. So there is also a cost saving from school perspective. So this was another big reason why school decides to go uh, for Chromebooks. Uh, and the third one is the simplicity. Um, not by accident, I also put the logo of the G Suite because many schools, when they started to become digital, they started selecting the platform. So they had to decide whether to use G Suite or Office uh, or Classroom from, uh, from Apple. When they decided to go from the G Suite and they started to use it on a not Chrome device, at the end, when it was the time to refresh their hardware, they decided to go with the natural choice. And the natural choice is the Chromebook. And I can give you just a very basic example. When I log in with my Chromebook, with my G Suite email, all the settings are automatically updated and synchronized. But if I'm using a G Suite, for instance, on a, a Windows notebook, these uh, settings are working only when I'm using Chrome. If I'm using another um, operative, another browser, I can skip some of this privacy unless I'm using an additional MDM system. So clearly it's the natural choice to go for a Chromebook if I decided to go with the, with the G Suite. And um, I also wanted to group some of the questions that uh, uh, we are frequently receiving from, uh, uh, from teachers. Um, so, and some of them are also belonging to the very first release of Chrome that was released in 2012. At the time, uh, the Chromebook were able only to work online. Well, this is not valid anymore. So many people think that Chromebook can only work online. It's not true. Uh, you can keep continuing working even if the, your connection is lost. And with the right Chrome extension, you can even start a brand new document when you are offline. I don't need antivirus. This we explained already. Another important aspect, especially when we need to uh, present uh, the, the project, for instance, on uh, using the Chromebook, and uh, schools are asking the parents to make the investment. It's happening a lot of time in many countries. Uh, having the opportunity to use the same, just one single Chromebook with different account, uh, including the personal Gmail, of course, it's a, it's a big asset. So, of course, parents are more, let's say, relaxed to do the investment because they're not just buying the Chromebook for the students. They can even buy a tools uh, for the family purposes. And with the G Suite, even the consumer version, you can really do whatever you need for the basic productivity. I can install the program either from the Google Play Store or from Linux. And uh, even though it's not available yet, uh, many companies are working uh, to provide uh, a virtual machine experience and uh, allow people using Chromebook to use the Windows desktop uh, program. 
Uh, the updates is another major topic because, of course, uh, the Chromebook update exists, uh, but they are used every six weeks, no matter what happens. As after six weeks, Google is releasing an update. But what is nice is that you just have to um, you just have to uh, restart the PC when it's done, um, because the system is installing and updating everything on your behalf. So even in this case, the experience and uh, the user experience in the classroom is completely transparent. So another big asset. And uh, if something happened, so I broken my Chromebook, uh, I'm uh, losing it, no problem. I can simply uh, jump into another Chromebook, insert my uh, login, and I'm not losing anything. So this is another great value without doing anything. And then I can use the G Suite for free because many people think it's uh, on payment, but the standard G Suite for education is totally free for schools. These are um, all the devices, um, all, sorry, all the, the assets about the Chromebook in general. Uh, but we do have specific Chromebook for education that are different from those that you can find, for instance, in the big retail store. So which are the differences between uh, a Chromebook built for education and a Chromebook uh, for retail? Well, first of all, we have uh, uh, versatility. Um, we've seen before, um, one of the best sellers in education are convertible notebook. I can use in four different ways. So, for instance, I can use uh, uh, with the standard uh, um, clamshell mode. I can use it in a 10 mode if I just need to, uh, to input with my, with my finger. If I have just to watch some content or some video, I can use it in, uh, sorry, this way, yes, in the display mode or also in the tablet mode, because there is a 360 inch that I can use it. And uh, this functionality combined with the second camera can offer the teachers the opportunity to record and capture videos and, and, uh, and photos. And the reason why we have decided on selected devices to place a camera, a second camera on the keyboard is because in the tablet mode, in order to capture a video, I'm using the device as a, a normal tablet where the camera is placed on the back. So in this way, the students can easily take a picture without uh, uh, any weird uh, uh, movement of the hands. And the second camera was added then in the second stage because we were receiving feedback from teachers say, it's a great tool. We would like to become really a portable and a media device. So this is why we, we have added. And as for those uh, that are willing also to use uh, the, the uh, digital writing. Some models, they also have the integrated pen uh, without any battery. So in this case, we avoid the risk to, to lose um, the, small, uh, the small batteries. Uh, but then what really makes a difference are the durability. Um, all the Chromebook that are defined for education, they need uh, to pass a military test. It means that they, they are guaranteed to work under certain um, circumstances like a high temperature, high humidity, high vibration. Uh, they can resist uh, to uh, drop eight from up to 122 centimeters. So that is just way above the standard height of a desk. Um, there is a spill resistant keyboard. So it means that you can spill up to 300 millimeters of water on top of the keyboard and nothing happens. So of course, uh, it's, it's pretty important. And a second feature that we have added on the keyboard is the mechanical uh, anchor keys. What does it mean? Um, it happens many times that students listen to the lesson, they are making playing with the keyboard. And if they remove accidentally one keys, it means that the keyboard has to be replaced. So the keyboard has to, the device has to be sent to the service. So you're losing time. But with the, the mechanical anchor keys keyboard, it's almost impossible for kids to remove the keys. So let's say is uh, preventing the student abuse. So this was very important. And again, we have implemented this listening to the feedback from schools. Last but not least, uh, they need to last. We want to avoid to have a charger on the, on the desk. So all the Chromebook designed for education, they have at least uh, 10 hours uh, of battery life. Um, I wanted just to, uh, yeah, I agree with Katie that the second camera is a very huge uh, and a very powerful tool. 
And if you're interested to know uh, which are the most uh, uh, adopted devices from school in MEA, this is our uh, personal uh, chart for the most preferred Chromebooks from school. This is related to the, um, let's say, 2020. So the most uh, adopted school is the convertible 11 inch. So the, the compact size. Why compact? For those that think that it's too small, well, first of all, it perfectly fits into the backpack. And secondly, you can use on your desk together with, for instance, regular books, if you're not uh, completely uh, digitalized. So that's why the 11 inch is the perfect choice. Second place for the standard clamshell, uh, because of, of course, is the entry level. So it's also depending on the budget that the school uh, has to spend. And then we have seen, uh, especially this year, a huge demand uh, in the 14 inches for teachers and for secondary school. And I'm not going because this is not the purpose to explain all the different options, but I just want to highlight one uh, uh, interesting feature that is, is becoming more popular and is related to the screen ratio. So usually the standard notebook or Chromebook, they have the 16 to 9, so the wide view, uh, the wide view uh, ratio on the display. But now they're becoming popular, like this model I have in my hands, the 3.2. What does it mean? It means that uh, it's uh, a little smaller, but the screen is higher. And so it means that if I'm visiting uh, the same web page on the standard uh, large view on, on this one, on this one, I have 20% uh, more of views. So if you are not really interested in watching too many videos or working on uh, too many uh, uh, documents and you're just focusing on pure productivity, so Google Classroom or Google Docs, this could be the natural choice. And we have seen a lot of schools, especially those with a, a well-established one-to-one learning more implemented, that they prefer to go on this screen ratio. So this was just a food for your thought. And if you want to, to know more, uh, and if you're interested to listen about the education trend overall in the market, we do have a dedicated blog that we have specifically designed for teachers. It's in English, so it's full of uh, also uh, tips uh, from uh, Apps Event that I think you know them. <laughs> so, and uh, thanks to the collaboration, you can uh, learn something new uh, every month uh, about uh, using uh, your Chrome or your G Suite at, uh, at their best. So this was all from my side. You can also follow uh, everything that we do for education in our social channel. And uh, if there is no more question, I uh, hand over to Ben. And thanks again for uh, for today's and have all of you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberto. Really a pleasure to, to catch up with you and hear from, uh, from you on all of those things. Really interesting about the devices that schools are choosing. Um, and some of the trends that you're seeing there as well around the screen ratio. Um, that that particular flip device that you showed, I, I, I've used that one where I flipped it into tablet mode and it does feel a lot more natural to use it as a tablet with that ratio than some of the, the standard shaped ones where you flip it around and it feels very long and thin. So um, I can back that one up as well. I know you need to go, so thank you so much. Um, we'll forward on any questions. Um, but just a massive thank you from us for, for taking the time. Um, I know that you've got your commute ahead of you, so thank you very, very much. Okay, so um, up next, we are gonna switch over to Bogdan. Welcome Bogdan, hope you're well. You, I may need to unmute you. Uh, yeah, that's the first thing on my checklist. I actually have a checklist in front of me for live training sessions. and uh, But the problem is I also have to look at the checklist and go through it before I go live. <laughs> cool. So welcome. Um, I will pass over to you. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'll let you get started and explain your session, and I'll catch you on the other side. OK, cool. I'll try to go a bit faster, because I know that we are a bit over time, so I'll try to, to speed things up. Um, so what's the whole idea of this session? Uh, because we were talking a lot about working from home, remote working and so on and so forth and keeping that work-life balance and uh, having boundaries and uh, so on and so forth. Now, one of the biggest issues is actually email because uh, as we all know it, 
Uh, you actually have um, a lot of emails coming, especially when you're remote working um, from all over the place, colleagues, students, uh, management teams, and so on and so forth. And one thing that I've seen very often in the past months while working with teachers is that everybody seems to be struggling, uh, just coping with uh, coping with uh, with the emails and coping with uh, all of that huge influx of notifications and updates and comments and um, you name it. Uh, and we've already heard a couple of tips uh, earlier, like hey, mute your notifications or manage your the incoming notifications. For example, as Ben mentioned it, take them away from your inbox to Google Chat, for example. So there are lots of different things that uh, that we can do. But I want to talk a bit about some small tips uh, in terms of how we can actually manage our inbox uh, in Gmail specifically, but many of them apply to any email client you would use because the principles would be, would be the same. So, um, we will look at several tips and then we'll try to bring everything together in what's called the inbox zero methodology. So that's something that I'm quite uh, passionate about because as I said, I've seen many teachers struggling with this and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to find uh, some, some solutions for that. So um, I did call the session team your inbox because as I said, this is something that's happening quite often. Uh, our inboxes look like a, a wild, uh, a wild bunch of uh, crazy animals jumping at us from uh, from all over the all over the place so i'll start right with the very first tip and the very first recommendation and as i said even though these tips would be related to gmail primarily uh, many of them would apply to other inbox types as well uh, so so the tip I'll give you would be to actually choose an inbox type that works for you. Now in Gmail, and I will go back and forth between the slides and be uh, between the actual Gmail interface so I can show you some of these things. Um, in Gmail, you have several different types of inboxes. So this is one of my demo accounts that I've been using for trainings. And uh, that's why I'm using this one to quickly show you some, uh, some tips. So as I said, this would be your default Gmail inbox, but you can easily change it. So if you go to the settings menu, the gear icon or cogwheel, this is where you'll see that you have several different types of inboxes. Now, there's no way we can go through all of these inbox type uh, inboxes um, now, but I just want to explain quickly how they would work and we'll focus on the default one, but we'll try to, to speed things up a bit and um, allow Gmail to help us to sort our incoming email. So first of all, the default inbox means that everything just ends up in your inbox and you're dealing with it as uh, with your emails as they come. You can also choose to have the important emails displayed first. And in this case, the very first emails that will be displayed will be the ones that Gmail uh, thinks are more important for you. And basically, Gmail actually also learns based on your behavior. So if you're quick to reply to some emails or if the emails are sent directly to you and so on and so forth, they will have a higher chance of actually being marked as uh, as important. You also have the option to say, you know what, I want to see all my unread emails first and then everything else. Or you might want to separate them based on the ones you manually start and then everything else. Now, as I said, I would invite you to have a look at these types of inboxes and see which one works for you. But now I want to focus actually on the default inbox. This is the one that makes uh, most uh, most uh, sense for me. And this is the one that um, I will actually be uh, using. I'm actually using on all my Gmail accounts. Now, there is a catch though. You have this customize button, which allows you to actually enable several extra categories. So once again, going back, this was my uh, initial state of my inbox, right? As you see, I have 376 unread emails, but with one simple change, if I change my inbox to um, still the default one, but I'm enabling these four different categories, all of a sudden, uh, my unread emails will drop to 27, which is awesome because I can now focus on these 27 emails and then move on and have a look at the other emails. 
Now, what's the story with these categories, though? And how is Gmail actually sorting the emails? Well, in the social category, this is where all the emails coming from social media channels like uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and so on and so forth, LinkedIn, and so on and so forth, they will all end up here. Now, on this account, I'm not using this email for any of any social media networks, so obviously there's no email in here. Under promotions, this is where you'll have uh, things like coupons, discounts, special offers, and so on and so forth. Or uh, in some cases, you might also receive notifications from Google Forms, for example, or from Google Calendar. In the Updates tab, this is where you'll have all of the notifications coming from Google Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Classroom, and so on and so forth. And especially if you're using the G Suite for teaching, this is one of the uh, big issues for many teachers. They are overwhelmed by all the email notifications coming from these services. Now, one thing you can do is, as I said, it's pretty straightforward. Enable the categories. All of these notifications will end up in your updates uh, tab rather than your primary inbox. And then you can look at it every now and then. You don't have to deal with the emails as they come. Of course, there are other options as well. So you could control your notifications in Google Drive, in Google Classroom, and so on and so forth. As Ben mentioned, it even maybe uh, separate them and have them sent to Google Chat rather than uh, your email. But this is something that we can do outside of the Gmail uh, inbox. And then the fourth uh, new category, which is the forums. This is where all the emails coming from Google groups or discussion groups or different forums. Uh, this is where you'll have all of these emails. So this is my first tip for you. Choose a type of inbox that actually makes sense and that works with your, uh, with your flow and uh, with your way of dealing with email. As I said, for me, the default email, uh, the default inbox with the different categories works the best. Now, let's go to the next step. This is where I've already uh, decreased my number of unread emails that I have to focus on from 300 something to 27, right? Um, so uh, the next step is, even though that already filtered the emails for me and it will filter all future incoming emails uh, for me, I can do more than that. And this is where labels can be very useful in Gmail. So what are labels? Uh, it's just like you would use labels in the offline world, right? We apply labels to objects to uh, help us organize them or identify them and so on and so forth. In our Gmail inbox, they will do the same thing. So we can actually use labels to organize our inbox to help us identify what's in the, uh, what's in the email and so on and so forth. Um, you can attach as many labels as you want to every email. So that's one advantage for Gmail over other email clients. Many email clients work with folders. So then you get an email and you drag it in a certain folder and then you have an email only in one folder. Whereas with Gmail labels, you can apply as many labels as you want to your emails and that will help you organize them and sort them much better. And once again, when it comes to labels, think about what you would want to label. You could label emails based on the content of the email. So I could set up a, a label, for example, for emails coming from my students or from my colleagues, or I could have a label for emails coming from my department, or I could have a label for emails coming from my uh, direct manager or principal and so on and so forth. And those labels will give me an idea of what's happening in that email and what I would uh, need to do with it. But besides the content labels, so these are the ones that most people use, we can also use labels which are called action labels. So for example, I could apply labels that would remind me that I have to do something about an email. As in, these are just some examples, of course, you, you can choose whatever works best for you. So to do as soon as possible, uh, for example, or to review or anything that uh, you find useful. Now I will say this though, Try to keep the number of labels to a minimum. Labels are there to help us organize our inboxes. If we get to a point where we need a system to help us organize our labels, we went too far. So uh, that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, so how can I use labels? Uh, as I said, I can just go to my inbox and uh, I can literally just select emails. 
I could even do them one by one. Um, so for example, these emails, I know that these are emails coming from my students. I know that they are related to a certain project. So I, because I did ask them to email me with some YouTube links and playlists and so on and so forth. So what I can do is I can select the emails, go to the label button, apply a label called students, which I've already created. And this is how my emails would look like now. I have my emails labeled. And once again, this would be the first step. Of course, I can also open an email and apply the label while I'm reading the email. It works in the exact same way. I can apply the label just as well. Now, having said that, this is an example of a content label. So it shows me what's inside that email. Now, because these emails, I know, as I've mentioned earlier, that they are related to a project that we are working on right now, I could apply another label and I would just say, you know what, these are not urgent. I can do them later, so I don't have to uh, worry about them right now. The next thing is I can also, once I have my labels in place and uh, I've decided which labels or which categories um uh, would be useful for me. As I said, try to think about a number, uh, a number of uh, labels that would help you out and would not create even more hassle for you. So I would say go with five, maximum 10 content labels and the action labels, choose the ones that make sense for you. Two, three, four, uh, four labels. Now, this is what labels are if I want to make them stand out. So let's say I want to have the emails coming from uh, from uh, my uh, my boss, my bo my other email address, Bogdan Kopil, right? Mr. Kopil at etech.coach. Let's say these are emails that are very important because I know that the emails coming from this person, I should read them the first thing in the morning. So I can apply the label. Uh, um, I could create a new label and I would just say, well, you know what, this is a really important email or person. So I could apply a label, something like VIP. Once again, this is just an example. You choose what works for you. When I was still teaching, I had a label for my head of department, head of year and uh, the other uh, management, uh, the other members of the management team. And I would apply a label which said something like management team. So I knew that those emails uh, might be uh, more urgent in some cases. Now, of course, the next step is I could also sort of customize my labels and uh, color them so that would make my life a bit easier. So once you create a label, if you go to the uh, left-hand side menu and uh, you just click on the label, you can actually change the colors and I would make this one stand out and I would color them in uh, red, orange, yellow, whatever color makes sense for, for me. So this is in a nutshell, the whole idea with labels. Uh, let me know in the comments if you are using labels. I've seen some of you already uh, mentioning labels earlier and uh, Wendy also mentioned filters. So Wendy went uh, a step ahead. Uh, and uh, this is actually the exact next step that we can, uh, we can take. So once we have our labels set in place and we know what labels uh, we want to use, the whole idea is to speed up the whole process. And so we want to automate some of this labeling process, right? Because it doesn't make sense for me to manually label every single email that comes to my inbox. So the next step is, as I said, I would want to automate uh, some of the labeling process. And we do that using filters. Uh, so Wendy and uh, Serdar mentioned filters already. Um, there are different ways of actually creating the filters. We could just start from a simple search. Remember that the search uh, function is very powerful in your Gmail inbox as well. And let's say I want to label all emails coming from, as I said, this particular email address. Um, I would want to automatically label them as VIP. Now, the main idea is that by doing this, by creating a filter, I will not have to manually label them uh, after I create the filter any longer. So yeah, Rachel, I totally agree with you. I would uh, also totally be lost without my labels, especially given the fact that I have more, more inboxes that I need to, to work with. So I have created the search um, uh, query. So these are all the emails I have received from, uh, from my particular, for this particular email address. And in the next step, 
If I'm happy with my search result, I can go and create a filter. Now, once I create the filter, I have the option to automate lots of different actions. So I could skip the inbox, I could mark the email as read, I could start it, I could apply a label. So in this case, I will automatically apply the VIP label for all emails coming from this particular uh, email address. Now, we will not focus on all the other options. We have several other options we can, we can play with. Uh, but the last one is important. So I can also choose to apply this filter I'm just creating to all my emails uh, already present in my inbox. So if there are matching emails, uh, they will be uh, labeled as well. The next step is, of course, I can create a filter. And from now on, every single email that will be coming from this email address uh, to, uh, to my uh, Bogdanji Bootcamp account will be automatically labeled with the VIP label. So once again, this is the next step. After you have your labels, think about what labeling processes you can automate or what other processes you can automate as well. So if you know, for example, that you receive emails from a colleague that um, you might want to uh, label them as in, FYI, read later, and so on and so forth. And you see that there is a trend and you receive the same types of emails from the same colleague over and over again. Just uh, just uh, create a filter and automatically mark those emails as read or automatically archive those emails, for example. Now, as you've seen, my emails got uh, automatically labeled as well. What is the next step? So, okay, we have labels, we have filters. This is where we move on and we start thinking about how, once again, how we can put these things uh, together. So when you have filters, as I said, this was a very simple example I showed you because also we have a limited time for the live session, but you can get very creative. You can put in a list of emails. You can search for a specific notification email. You can uh, search for emails coming from Google Classroom, for example, or you could get very, very creative, as I said. Or for example, you could create a label uh, or a filter which searches for emails in which you are CC'd. What does that mean usually when you are CC'd in an email? It means that you're included in the email more for staying in the loop and being informed, but you wouldn't necessarily have to do something about that email. So one quick and easy uh, tip for this is just create a label that applies, uh, sorry, just create a filter that automatically applies uh, a label that says CC or FYI to all the emails in which you're only CC. So that will automatically give you a hint of what you would have to do with that email or better said, the fact that you might not have to do uh, so and so many things uh, with that particular email. So this is where we sort of get to the point where we talk about the Inbox Zero approach. So what's the whole idea with Inbox Zero? We start from the idea that our inbox is our to-do list. So we literally treat our inbox as our to-do list. So we start by sorting all emails. Let's say I get to school in the morning or I open my laptop in the morning and I start sorting my emails. That's the very first thing I do. And this is important when I say sorting the emails, I mean literally applying action labels to my emails. You can think about it as dealing with snail mail. What were we doing back in the day when we would receive snail mail? We would have, I don't know, four, five, six envelopes. We would get them out of the post box and then we would get home. We wouldn't open one and deal with it and then open the second one and then deal with it and then open the third one and then deal with it. No, instead we would have a look at the envelope. We would say, okay, this is an invoice. I'll put it in the invoice pile. This is a letter from my friend. I'll put it in the letter from my fan pile. This is spam. I'll put it in the spam uh, pile. And then I would go and take each individual pile and I would deal with all of them at once. So if I have to pay invoices, I would take the invoice pile. I will deal with them. If I want to reply to my friends, I would reply to their letters and so on and so forth. How can we use this when it comes to inbox or our inboxes? Uh, there are several basic principles. Once again, this is where you will need to find your rhythm and tweak things out, uh, tweak things around your, your, your own workflow. But these are some basic starting points. As I said, I get to school in the morning or I open my laptop, I go through my emails and I do the following things. If I can deal with the email under two minutes, I do it on the spot. I reply on the spot and then 
I'm done with that email, I am archiving it and removing it from my inbox. If there are urgent emails, I will label them with to do as soon as possible. Let me rephrase that. If there are urgent emails that I cannot deal with under two minutes, I will apply the label to do as soon as possible. And then I would archive the email. The next category of emails in terms of uh, priority, all the other emails that are not urgent, I can choose uh, to label them as to do later, or I could just say archive or uh, snooze. Uh, to do, I mean, label them as to do later and archive them, or you could choose to snooze them for a later uh, later time. Personally, I prefer labeling them and archiving them, but once again, everybody needs to find what works best for, for their workflow. And else, everything else that doesn't need to be done as soon as possible or later, or it's just FYI or whatever, or I don't need to add an action label, just label them with the content labels I need and then uh, archive them. Now, this is the moment when I actually go and work on my emails after I sort them. So I start my day with a sorting session, which takes anything between 5, 10, 20 minutes, depending on the day. And then I go and start working on the emails and I will prioritize those which are urgent. So let me clarify a couple of things in terms of what archiving does. So let's say this is my inbox when I get to school in the morning and uh, let me demonstrate how this would work, right? I would just go through a couple of emails as an example. So I'll go to my first email, I'll open it, um, I'll see, okay, this is an email from my boss, let's say. It's already labeled as VIP, so I know that uh, that would be from my boss. But in this case, it's an email that is inviting me. I don't, My boss is inviting me for a grill. It's not urgent. I don't have to reply now. So what I will do is I will just say to do later, and then I will archive the email. Now, what happens when I archive the email? That email just disappears from my inbox. So it's, as I said, think about your inbox as a to-do list. When you archive an email, it's gone from your inbox. Uh, it's not gone from your to-do list though. Uh, I've just placed it in the to-do later category. Now, once again, if I go to my label, which is on the left-hand side, like to-do later, you'll see that this email is now in the to-do later category. So I can get back to it and actually deal with uh, what I have to do um, uh, for for my boss and then get finally get it off my to-do list. But because it's not urgent, I'll just uh, postpone it for, for later. And I'll go to the next email. And once again, my boss is send, requiring me uh, um, urgent update for uh, regarding a student. I cannot do it now and it takes me more than two minutes. I will label it to do as soon as possible. I will archive the email. And I will go to the next email. This is an email from my student. It's already marked as to do later. I can archive it and move on. As in, in fact, all of these emails which are coming from my students, I know that I've already labeled them as to do later. I showed you earlier. I can just archive them and that's it. Uh, and uh, then I can literally just go through all of, my, all of my emails in the inbox. And as I said, I will follow the same process. Now, once I'm done with sorting my emails in the sorting session, that's when the next step is to go to the to do as soon as possible label. And this is when I start working on the emails. This is when I start replying to the emails. So what I will do now is I will go and I'll just say, hey boss, uh, please find the uh, requested uh, report attached. And by the way, what you've just not noticed is the Smart Compose uh, feature, which actually add suggestions to your email based on your conversation. So that's a big uh, time saver as well. So uh, of course, then I would attach the document. In the meantime, I would work on the report. I would then attach it to the, doc to the email and I would send it uh, to my boss and I would just hit send. The next thing I would do is now that I'm done with this email, I can remove the to do as soon as possible label. Now, when I do this, that email finally went away from my to-do list. And I know that I've got one of the urgent emails out of the way. I can go to my next important email. Now, this is also an email that is important. I could just open the form, see what I need to do with it, uh, answer the form. When I'm done, I would remove the to-do as soon as possible. And voila, 
the email is gone from my to-do list and so on and so forth. I will do the same thing with all of the other important emails once I'm done with them and uh, my to-do as soon as possible um, label will be, I mean, um, category will be empty. I'm happy because I'm done with the urgent emails. And then depending on how much time I still have, I can go and work on some of the to-do later emails. These are emails that were not urgent, but uh, I still need to do something about them. So once again, these are the ones that are lower in priority and I would treat, I would deal with them after I'm done with the really urgent ones. Now, this is once again, just a quick, uh, this was just a quick example of how the whole inbox your methodology would work. Uh, we would go through, through them um, just step by step uh, and uh, we would actually separate them first, filter them, I mean, uh, sort them first and then work on the urgent ones. So just to sort of wrap things up uh, and uh, I'll just give quickly some tips because we are running out of time. Uh, I do hope that uh, this whole idea of uh, the inbox zero approach makes sense, uh, even though it was just a quick demonstration. Uh, do let me know in the comments if you are using uh, the inbox zero methodology or if you have a different approach or if you thought about using action labels as well. Now, just a quick, uh, just some quick tips uh, to wrap things up. Remember that uh, just don't let the email rule your day. So this is what kids usually tell to parents, you're not a boss of me or to adults. Treat your email in the same way. That means switch notifications off, uh, set times when you actually go through the emails and uh, sort them and then work on them uh, when after you've uh, prioritized them. Um, as I said, keep notifications off. Treat your email like snail mail. And I would say schedule those email sorting sessions throughout the day based on how many emails you receive that or how many urgent emails you receive. That could be three to five sessions a day. It could be 10 sessions a day. It depends a lot on each, uh, each of our um, uh, situations. And unsubscribe for new let from newsletters. Uh, that's a lot of emails that we usually have to deal with. And one last thing, find your rhythm. So all of these things that I've mentioned, labels, filters, uh, how many times you should filter, uh, sort your emails and have the scheduling sessions, reanalyze your workflow, decide what works best for you and always update your, your procedures. So just try to find your rhythm that works for you, which could also change from week to week and uh, from, from month to month. And uh, I'll stop here. But of course, if you have questions, I'm more than happy to, to talk about uh, any other ideas. And uh, yeah, I'm a total Gmail geek, so we could talk about it uh, for <laughs> days in a row. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I think there's a lot of things that, um, a few of the things I do, some I definitely need to add into my repertoire and lots that I learned about how I can get on top of my Gmail too. Thank you so much, Bogdan. Really appreciate you sharing a few of your tips. Um, and you're also you're seeing some of the comments that there's a a lot of a lot of love for filters and labels in particular. Seems yeah, to this be is this favorite. is my this is my tribe. When I see people loving labels and filters, I feel like home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've also got comments like this as well. So uh, um, many many thanks. Hopefully, I don't know if you can, but if you can stick around yeah. for the SD conversation next, that would be. Superb and ideal. Keep the questions coming in. You might notice that Bogdan is on the chat and um, is is very capable of kind of uh, contributing and answering questions at the same time. So if there's the anything power that you of want, to... screens because we were mentioning it earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm currently on four. Uh, <laughs> this is just a bit too much for me, I think. Um, but right. Uh, moving on from that, then, we are going to talk next about the ISTE certification. So if, like myself, um, you're based in either the UK or Europe, um, I don't know how familiar you are, you, you are with ISTE as an organization. Um, I imagine if you're in the US, you're very familiar with them. So the ISTE created a set of teacher standards uh, some years ago, and they update them regularly. Um, but more recently, they've developed that into a certification. So that's what we're going to talk about next, which means I am going to bring in Wendy and Gitto as well. And I'll just uh, remove Bogdan's Twitter handle so we can all see Gitto uh, there. So yeah, um, a learning lab, which is part of Apps Events, is, is now in a position to deliver the ISTE certification, which we're really, really pleased about. We think it's um, uh, a superb addition to 
the sort of trading on technology we're used to doing anyway. Um, but what I'm going to sort of try and do is fire a few questions at the three of you. Um, you've all been through the whole process of the what would normally be two face-to-face -face training days, followed by the online sort of portfolio piece of work um, that takes place over several months following the training. I and mean, it's worth saying that now, obviously, because of current circumstances, um, we can deliver those two days remotely. Um, so um, if you go to alearninglab.com, you can have a look at, at what that looks like and inquire about setting that up. But yeah, um, Gitta, I don't know if you want to start with your reflections on the ISTE certification. Um, I suppose the questions are probably, though I'm looking forward to more questions coming in, is what is it? Why would it be useful for me? And what does it kind of look like? What's the what's involved? Um, so the ISTE uh, standards, first of all, you have the ISTE educator standards and the um, student standards. I'm going to say straight away, Wendy and Bogdan do pipe in if I say something that's wrong here. Um, and there's a set of standards not specific to a subject or specific to a uh, primary teacher or a further education teacher. They're the educator ones are basically what you can do to make sure you're a good teacher. I guess that's the simplest way of saying it. They're standards um, centered around your own development, so to make sure that you are continuing to learn as an educator, um, and then alongside how you are uh, guiding your own students, both to be um, good citizens, looking at uh, how to behave online and so on, but also help them uh, in terms of design thinking. Ben, I know that's a big part for you. Um, I want to say 25, 26 standards. Wendy, you're the expert on this. I can tell you right away. She'll tell me off the top of her head how many standards there are in the educator one. Am I close on 25? 24, is it 25? There you go. Right, that's the place. Um, and even before you, even if without doing the um, certification itself, they're well worth accessing anyway. Um, so I'm sure someone can grab the link and pop it in the comments anyway um, while we're talking. But they're a good set of standards to. Uh, follow as an educator. Oh, perfect, even on screen there, Ben. Uh, they're useful standards to follow anyway. Now, the certification process um, takes it a step further. You normally, I hate saying during normal times, but you know what I mean. Uh, in pre-lockdown times, I guess, uh, it involves a two-day uh, pretty intensive course. Uh, we all gathered back in Fe February, right just before, a week or two before, um, Lockdown started here in the UK. We gathered for two days of face-to-face -face training. Um, and it's intensive and it's inspiring. Um, it really makes you look deeper at yourself as an educator, um, taking you out of that day-to-day -day, uh, in the classroom where you're constantly having to think on your feet and actually sit back and going, oh, yeah, maybe I do do that when I shouldn't. Or, oh, I never thought of doing this. Or, which is equally as valid sometimes, going, yeah, I do do that. Maybe I am a good teacher a little bit then. Uh, so it starts off with those two days. Then, um, if I pass to Wendy, if you want to talk a bit about the online training that follows after that. Yes, the online training was really interesting because I think the bit I liked best was when we had the two full days, first of all, we got to meet each other. If, you, if we weren't a group that were already doing it together, we would be in a cohort. Um, we would have had that two days to actually get used to each other. And then you move on to your online, um, online uh, course. Um, the way we're going to run that is that they will have, be in a cohort and they'll do that online, but there will be sessions where they're talking together before they go off and do their individual study. And I think that's going to be a really important part of it because you can feel quite isolated. Um, and then we had five weeks to do the actual online part. And throughout that, there was a lot to do. So you had deadlines for each week. So you weren't just left to do the whole thing in one go. You had uh, each week you had deadlines with two or three things you had to do. And there was a range of things you had to do. So sometimes you would be uh, writing or creating a, an artifact. Sometimes you would be uh, posting something up as a discussion thread, and then you would have to peer uh, review someone else's work. Sometimes you'd be giving video uh, feedback. So there was a whole range of different things to do then. I think that really keeps you engaged. And um, there was also really good feedback and timely feedback from the team as well. So that, you know, it kept you on track. Yeah, I, I, I did find it uh, interesting and interesting actually that I hadn't 
expected how much it was still working together in a way. Even though we're all working our own way through the criteria and we're all working from home. So even this this online part is online during normal times as well. It's uh, self-learning in a way, following the online course. But every week it was give feedback to others on what they've written. Um, put your reflections here and look at other people's reflections and give feedback to that. Or look at the resource they've made and give them feedback so they can improve it. So it's constant talking and working together um, anyway, even in a asynchronous course, we're all doing it at different times of the week. And I guess having those deadlines, even though sometimes uh, I would lambast them to high heaven, they're actually useful in that because it kept us all around the same work at the same time, meaning that we could still have those discussions. We had a nice chat group going with everyone helping each other out as well. I thought also thought it was really yes. useful because we got to see what our colleagues were doing as well. So, and, and we don't often get that chance to do that. I, you know, I learned a lot about the team that I was working with and how they work and their approaches to things through that. And that sort of opened my eyes quite a lot. Sorry, Bogdan. No, actually, that's exactly what I wanted to say as well, because that's happening quite often, even in schools, when we would like to work with our colleagues, but we don't have time because things get crazy. That's one thing. The other thing is now we were working not only with our direct colleagues, but you can actually work with teachers from other schools, other countries, other states, wherever, and you can get so many different uh, insights that you wouldn't have received just in your school. So that's just an added bonus. Well, I think it's fair to say that that SD didn't create this to be a tick box exercise that could be done in a short period of time. See, <laughs> that was a very enthusiastic uh, sort of agreement there for everyone. Well, disagreement, if you like. Um, so I, I, the, the impression I get is that uh, that it's really valuable to have that team around you. Um, I equate it in a very different circumstance to um, my wife and her sort of, um, uh, uh, what's the name of the group that gathers together before you give birth? Oh, N... I completely forgot NCPT or something like that. But that group where you just need to have someone who understands exactly what you're going through at that time. Um, and as much as people can be supportive, it's nice to have that backup of like uh, working together. So it sounds like that's an important part of the process. Yeah, ach ach achieving this uh, certification, it's I say it's not a tick box exercise. It's it's a it's a substantial contribution of time. Um, and you've got to be aware of that beforehand. You're, yes, you've got the two-day workshop, or now that it's online, um, I think it's five to our webinars. Um, it's running at, no, four, sorry, to our webinars is running at now. So yes, you have that, but then you have these five weeks of online learning, probably three to four hours a week um, working on those. And then when that's finished, you then have your portfolio phase, which lasts over four to six months, less intensive than when you're doing those three and a half hours each week. But uh, it's still a substantial um, input where you're showing evidence of you uh, using these standards and reaching these standards in your daily working life. So it's something that when you finish, um, which we've all done recently, our deadline's been quite recent, you really do have that sense of satisfaction. You feel that, wow, I, I've achieved this. I haven't been given this. Um, not everyone passes. Not everyone reaches, even submits work by the end, I guess. Um, luckily, the majority do. But it's a certification that, yes, is worth having uh, on CV. Yes, it's worth having because it improves your own um, pedagogy and your own uh, learning. But it also makes you feel quite good when you get it in that you've worked hard and you've been recognized for that hard work. Yeah, because one of the things we've been looking at in terms of delivering this is, is obviously yourselves as trainers will be there to support that cohort through the, whether it's two days in person or whether it's the, the four sessions um, but there's a wider team and what we're looking to do is obviously pair up trainers where possible and then when they go into the online phase which is arguably the difficult bit right where you step away from that course together and you've got to work a bit more independently we're looking for some consistent support across that to make sure people feel supported through it um obviously like Bogdan said there's the opportunity to work so there's going to be online courses that anyone from you know where time zone is convenient, can join and work together. Um, but it also, you know, there's going to be the option to have it hosted by your school or you might decide that a group of three or four of you are going to join together. Um, so there's definitely some support that we're putting in place to make sure that 
it is a manageable challenge. Um, but like you say, it's a challenge nonetheless. What are some of the insights that you've kind of felt as you've gone through the standards and built your artifacts and given feedback? Are there any kind of standout moments of reflection for yourselves on your own practices? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of the things when I first read the standards, because it, does, it is a really good idea to, if you're thinking of doing this, to look at the standards first, don't come in cold to it, have a read through them. If they don't completely make sense, that's fine, but have read them before you start. But I noticed that, you know, I read a few and thought, oh, that's really easy. I do that all the time. Um, and when I went to put the portfolio together, actually put the artifact together, I really had to dig deep to find evidence that I was doing that. So, for instance, there's um, Citizen 3C, which is looking at intellectual property and and what else is it looking at? Safe and legal use of stuff. Yeah. So I thought I did that all the time. And it wasn't until I, I really started to look at the artifacts, I realized, yes, I do it, but it's sporadic. It's hit and miss where I do it. And as a trainer, uh, rather than a teacher that's seeing the same people over and over again, I um, really have to find ways where I could build evidence of that into my practice across the board. So I think it really did change the way I did that and, and, and certain other things as well. I also had a similar issue, uh, like when you said, as a trainer, the perspective is slightly different uh, because we see like our learners, the teachers, we see them for one or two days or four or six sessions online and so on and so forth. And we have to adapt things. Uh, and I also had uh, that, let's call it struggle or let's say opportunity, uh, because that also forced me to organize my training sessions better, to find that silver lining that would remind me to have a look at all of these standards and also implement them in every single session, even if it's just, hey, let's have a look at this quickly and uh, let's think about how you can do that with your students in the classroom. For me, that was, as I said, the opportunity because um, it was that structure that helped me keep things together in a very cohesive way. I was mentioning to, to follow your example, the whole idea of copyright and intellectual property before, but since I started working on the portfolio, everything seemed to fit much better in place. And that's, I think, the biggest outcome for me from this whole process, not the artifacts, not the standards, not the portfolio, but how I've changed my approach while I was working on the portfolio and how I started to look at things from a different angle. Absolutely. I found that, so in the group of us that took it at the same time, we had a, Bogdan referred to there, a mix of people who are trainers and they've spend their time training adults and not the same adults each week, moving from one school to another, set of teachers from another. And we had full-time teachers who have their own class and run. And it was interesting to be a bit of bridge in that gap because I still teach my own class, but also do training. And the thing that hit me was that the skills really were bridging both. The criteria hitting, some of them going, oh, I do that in my trainings all the time. And then a bit down the road, as Wendy said, when you suddenly think, I don't do it in my class that often. <laughs> Or, oh, yeah, I do this with the children every day. I've never done that in my trainings. And it, it was quite open to, to, it's not obvious when you say it, but to realize, yeah, that the skills I need to teach my seven year old students, a lot of those are skills I need when I'm teaching those 30 to 50 year old teachers as well. Yeah, you you were quite a rowdy group, if I remember correctly, in London. So I think some, yeah, some of those seven year old teaching skills were definitely needed. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, that's a really important point, I think, about it is whether you're uh, kind of um, working as a kind of uh, ed tech coach across a, a, a load of teachers and you're not in the classroom every day, or whether you are sort of grade four teaching uh, each and every day with all the students, there seems to be something in there for both of those situations and obviously a great opportunity to to work together and actually um obviously we've got the three of you on today um but in terms of our cohort of trainers who are going to be uh, delivering these sessions um Gitta, your background is primary you still work in a primary school wendy your background's in further education bogdan a secondary science teacher so we've got though a lot of coverage um obviously kim is sort of middle school uh, based in Germany and Heather in the Netherlands. So I think one of the things that we were really pleased to be able to do was um, have a wide range of 
expertise and backgrounds amongst the trainers and we'll try and con continue to build that as we go and hopefully we'll see that reflected in the cohorts that you work with yeah that'll be interesting and uh what is great as in we've 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 pushed quite heavily against them on the commitment it took and the the work it took into it but obviously as a team now of trainers um the support that we'll be giving is model on the support we got when we did it ourselves so uh, we had three different um, trainers working with us, either in person on the day or then through the process. And Wendy said timely feedback earlier. It's yes, you submit things every week and you get feedback pretty much a couple of days after um, each week. You have uh, trainers there that you can contact and ask questions. I think I've lost count on the amount of video calls we've been together uh, with one or more of the trainers over the past six months. So you've got the joint support of that team of trainers behind you, which will be us now. Um, but then also of your own group. And I, I cannot stress enough how useful it has to have a group just for those in your cohorts, uh, probably without the trainers, just so that you can uh, ask the questions a lot of teams every now and then, every now and then as well. But I'll still remember those trainers are there at the other end of email. Um, and when things got uh, harder or when we had difficulties with things, they were always there to email and to answer and to come into chats when we needed them. And I think that's something that we then are going to model ourselves on uh, from what we experienced when we were the students. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be one of the, the big advantages going into the, the the courses you deliver is it's it's pretty recent that you've been through it and, and been in their shoes, which will be really valuable. And I think um, hopefully we'll also see trainers come from cohorts like we do with, with all of the Google for Education work that we do. And there's many trainers I now work with that were attendees in my sessions and things like that. Um, actually, I, I noticed Katie's put a comment, I appreciate certifications that actually mean something. Um, I, I know that we've spoken to a few schools where they've, they've um, provided the opportunity for their teachers to become uh, Google certified educators, level one, level two, through to certified trainer. And actually, a few of the schools that we've worked with before are looking at this as their next step. Um, while they've, they've found that G Suite and Chromebooks and uh, their teachers sort of moving through the educator and trainer certifications has been really valuable for the, the learning they're able to offer, that actually this seemed like the logical next step for them to look a bit more wide, widely at their pedagogy and how they can leverage technology effectively. Um, does that feel like the? Does that feel like relevant that you can take these standards and and apply it in the way that you do get the best out of technology in schools? Absolutely, yeah, because it's not um, dependent on the technology you use either. So you can do one artifact uh, on Google and another on a, a different platform. It doesn't matter what the technology it is you're using. That's what becomes irrelevant really in terms of the certification. It's more about how you're using it and how you're you putting the strategies in place to use it. Um, yeah, for me, that's that was really interesting to see because we focused a lot on Google over the, over the last few years. So it was good to sort of just look and to see what other people were using. It made sense to me to also put in your Twitter handle as well, Wendy, while you were, while you were sharing there, because I know that you share a lot of good stuff um, if people are sort of once it's not only for ISTE, but um, actually a bit of a shout out for your Feel Good Edgy. Um, so one of Wendy's key projects is around... Uh, I suppose supporting mental health and well-being for teachers and educators, it's never an easy job and it's often got tougher. I know further education in particular um, has had a, a very challenging time here in the UK. Um, so, yeah, as well as as well as ISTE's, uh, ISTE tips and various things, um, following Wendy is also a really useful thing if you sort of want to sort of manage that challenge of balancing work and life and everything else as well. One of the um, up, ben that you said earlier about having you know we're looking at um, some schools doing the the ISTE certification together at first uh, that is going to be so valuable for the school because it's great when one person does it and they're the person that goes in and advocates for it but 
if you have a group of people going in like we did, you can totally change the way your um, school or college works really quickly because you've got a group of people that have made that change together. Um, and, the, you know, it's like 10 times learning, really. It's 10 times the change in, the, in that same time because you've got all of those people working together. And it also gives you a chance to talk to people you know that are doing a similar job in a similar organisation. Um, and I know even though we're working uh, in, in different training sets, sessions we've sort of talked behind the scenes and looked at each other's portfolios and and given tips on how we might go or just chatted about it and I think that's really good I mean, it'll work if you've got a cohort of strangers to start with because you won't be strangers but I think there is real value in a group of people from the same school doing it together yeah and, and one of the things that I found about the the situation we found ourselves with COVID-19 and, and working remotely is that while um, I really value our in-person sessions and the relationships you can build in those. One of the things that has been a benefit of providing more remote sessions is actually access to the training, uh, a more equitable access. Um, it, some schools are very able to provide their teachers with time to leave school for a day or two and engage in training. But actually for a lot of schools, that's really difficult for a number of reasons. Um, and actually remote training, because you don't want to sit on a video call for seven or eight hours in the day. Remote training inevitably gets split up over a period of time. So um, it does feel like there's more option to actually engage in that for more people. Um, so hopefully we'll see that too. So just in case you are interested in finding a bit more about the um, online ISTE offering, the 100% online program, um, then feel free to, to follow that little bitly link and find out a little bit more about how you can sign up for that. Um, I feel like it, we're, it's sort of natural time to start wrapping up. Really appreciate everyone's contributions so far. Anything that anyone wants to add in relation to ISTE or anything else we've spoken about today before we, uh, before we close out and just give our thank yous to everyone's time? Just that we mentioned about, we've constantly mentioned about the, the time commitment and the fact that there's a lot of work for it. Don't let that put you off if that's suddenly been something you thought, oh, okay, it's the, they're all saying it's a lot of work. Because when we were going through the online course uh, and moved into the portfolio section, we had already made some artifacts that we could directly use in our portfolio. So there was some time saving there. If you did well on the online and it was marked and it was marked as a pass, it could go straight into the portfolio. So it's worth keeping that in mind too. Good tip, yeah. And I, I think it's sort of a lot of the things that naturally teachers are doing in the classroom, there's a time limit, isn't there, on the artifacts you could use. They need to be within a certain amount of time and when you when you submit, is that right? Two years. So, so things that you're doing day to day can be utilized. It's not all net new content that you have to create. No, and, and often, since by the time you finish your portfolio, you're four to six months or even longer from when you started the process. So you will have started implementing some of these things in your work day to day anyway, hopefully. If you've gone seven months and haven't, then you haven't paid enough notice. Um, so it's not sitting there doing new stuff all the time. It's identifying, yeah, I, I, I used it well there. Let's use that as evidence. Um, so it's not sitting down and doing all this extra work all the time. A lot of it is identifying when you did do a good job in your actual day-to-day -day work, and you can use that as your evidence. Awesome. Um, can I just quickly add something on top of that? You also have the moments when you realize, oh, I could have done this so much more efficient for myself and my students, and it could have helped the learning process so much more if I would have just tweaked this small thing. And all of these things come to you while you're working on the portfolio as well. So it's not like major changes, but just uh, you have a different awareness of what's happening just because you have those standards on, on your mind and on top of your mind, then you can just look at what you're doing. Well, that's one of the key so things, isn't it? The training well. is you will become almost sort of, you will know the standards inside out. You, yeah. Or is it like the matrix where just in every learning scenario, you're like, oh, that is C. <laughs> That's a 4 I talk a whole new language. <laughs> I was in a training session then with, with a school and they were on a particular piece of software. And at the end 
end of it, somebody said, do you know any software that does X, Y, and Z? And I said, oh, yeah, this particular piece of software, I know of it, but I've never used it. And the teacher said, would you mind if we had a look? And normally I'd have said, give me a week, I'll learn a bit, I'll teach you. And I thought, oh, standard, standard, that'll take us down. <laughs> do this <laughs> and I got really excited and we did it there and then so it was you know you do actually change your process on your mind all the time and you're fitting it in where where it's coming um in your natural teaching so it is quite a fun thing to do but it's it is rigorous too it's well worth doing okay there we have it so um I've I've just posted in the comments please do let us know if you've got any questions uh, and obviously sort of continue to reach out and we'll reply to those. Um, so the SD certification, you can you can host that at your school if you feel that you're in a situation where that is possible. Uh, and one of our amazing trainers will, will come along and deliver that two days and then you'll get the follow up of the online support as you move towards that certification. Um, you can do the 100 percent online option and the link is still there if you want to find out a bit more about that. Um, and yeah, we're just uh, really excited to be able to continue to work with schools on developing their effective use of technology in addition to our Google for Education work also um, through the AE Learning Lab in ISTE. Um, so thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Bogdan, for your Gmail tips. Thank you, Wendy, for your contribution on this um, and the ISTE standards and your, I know that you were um, one of the shining lights that everyone kind of referred to very timely with your uh portfolio submission so um great to get your insight on that one and uh and Gitta, you mentioned it earlier your very late nights and i know some of those were dedicated to isti at times but just for everyone out there you don't need to do it between 10 p.m and 1 a.m that's, that's just a Gitta way of working um when when ellis is sleeping i think is the key bit, isn't it Cool. So um, I just wanted to bring back in a couple of things to remind you of. So there's still a chance if you want to use that link to sign up to win some free tickets to some of the boot camps or summits. Um, so we'd love to, to sort of be able to offer that up to as many people as possible. Um, so please do submit that uh, via that form there, the gsummit.link forward slash Acer. Um, massive thank you to Roberto and Acer. Um, these uh, free events are things that we're able to do with ACES support. So we continue to thank them for making that possible um, and providing the backing that they do. And uh, without further ado, if there are no more questions, I will let you all head out to the rest of your afternoons, evenings, early mornings, depending on where you're viewing from. And obviously, if you're picking this up at another time, hopefully you found lots of tips to make it really useful for you. Um, so yeah, massive thank you. We have got some future summits coming up. The next one uh, on November the 7th will be specifically North America focused, where we're going to be looking at maths and science uh, related support. So for the STEM classroom, um, particularly maths and science, we've got some great tips from some great trainers there. And uh, obviously subscribe and keep up to date with the tips and tricks coming from SETI and everybody else as well. These videos are getting chopped up into bite-sized pieces. So within um, a few sort of days or weeks, you'll be able to see Bogdan's Gmail section just chopped down specifically for you. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day and bid you all farewell. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye. Thank you. I don't understand.